The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Oh no, my phone has died. I won't know what time to take my gas X pills. <gasps> oh no, my phone and computer have both died at exactly the same time. I won't know when to feed my live-in sloth. We have a job. My gas X, your sloth, what are we gonna do? Well, I was thinking about the best way to wire up a clock the other day, also sloths. Really? I've also been thinking about this. <gasps> Felix. Am I sensing a clock off? A clock off? What's a clock off? A clock off is when two people enter a competition to see which one can wire up the best clock. Oh, I get it. A clock off. That's right. A clock off. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Where are my dragons? Inspired designs. Bend them hatches! Regrettable acting. I want to live in a world with Star Wars again! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. So I was pinning out this boring old seven-segment display, and I thought, hey, look what we have left over. We have the 8x8 64 LED displays left over from Jared, the Dungeon Master. What if I use these to make a clock? And I know what you're probably thinking is like, that's crazy. I wonder if I could separate it instead of doing singles, 10 minutes, single hours, tens hours. What if I kind of grouped it into just uh, hours and minutes like that? And then, well, these displays are matrix, so we would need a times eight matrix, although you could easily get that because we have all sorts of timers on this system. It would not be hard to find a times eight uh, timer. I mean, we could just pull it off of one of the other timers. So what if it was, um, there was a RAM pointer for the hours and minutes, and the RAM pointer had a 16 byte offset, and then we multiplied that by the value because if we did that, we'd have to use an 8-bit counter for each. 4-bit wouldn't be enough. Oh, this is so ridiculous. So we could do uh, like, like this, like you'd have your start pointer there. So if you picture it like this, right, in, in memory, and then these are your bytes. You'd have 16 bytes. And so let's say, you know, it's, you know, 0, 0 o'clock. So it's 12 o'clock, like that, right? So you'd look at it like this. So in memory, you would draw the zeros like that. Oh, you know what? Um, there's this thing called the Ardu Boy. It's like this little handheld game system with a OLED screen. And uh, the reason I bring it up is because it has an online converter for, for graphics. And on that system, like if you have, let's say you had the character zero, it's stored in memory like this. It's sliced up this way because that's how the screen is drawn. So we could use that same conversion utility to create an EEPROM pattern, right? So we could start here at 0, 15 offset and then multiply it by the digit. Yeah. I mean, that would only be how many bytes? Um, 60 minutes plus 12 hours, which is 72 characters times 16 bytes. Oh, that's just over 1K. We could fit that in a 2K EEPROM, no problem. Hmm, actually, how much does 60 take? 60 times 16? Oh, 960, even better. So we could use the bottom half of the EEPROM for the minutes and the top half for the hours. This is really, really over the top. Oh, here we go. This is, drawing is not horrible. One to eight, nine to 16. All right, let's see if we can make something light up. Let's broaden our minds. I'm just gonna set like a couple volts just so we don't cook anything. Uh, let's see, 13, nine, what's the easiest? Uh, 13, 16, one apparently will do something. That's easy, so let's just figure out where the orientation is. Uh, 16 would be positive, down to 1, which would be the sink. Oh yeah, there's a light right there. Beauty. All right, cool. That tells us the orientation of that. So pin 1 is the one on the left in front of the text. Actually, you know, I mean, if we could make something that would draw a, uh, basically a bitmapped font onto a matrix of LEDs without a microcontroller, that would be actually kind of cool. 
and then see, we can just put two LEDs in the middle, and that would be our blinking, our blinking seconds cursor. So we could use the 16-bit timer. Uh, basically, we could use bit 16 of it, you know, on, off, on, off. So yeah, look, this actually does go in that direction. So you have the uh, positive voltage here, which would be the row. Well, actually, it's the column. I'm sorry, here, so think about it this way. Per my drawing, uh, you would energize whatever the current column was, and then you would sync it into the row. So your current is going this way. Oh yeah, because if we have 16 lines, we could, we could use the lower, the lower four bits of the EEPROM. That could be our, that could be our column counter. See, we count from zero to 15. That's a uh, zero down to three thing. Then we would need a counter for here. Probably could use two cascading shift registers or a decade counter basically to say which column's active because we would have, well, we'd have 32 columns. Yeah, that part we'd have to figure it out. So basically we would go do 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 we'd draw it like this, right? Right down the line. <laughs> Max has this look on his face like he just ate a lemon. All right, well, I've chosen to embark on a stupid endeavor, but I guess now I'm, I'm stuck on my path of righteousness. But I did think I could probably use a uh, three to eight decoder demultiplexer to drive the columns. Take a look at this. Um, I think we used, oh yeah, we, we were gonna use this on the Z80 project, but we didn't actually end up using it. Well, look at this, basically it takes three bits and turns it into uh, eight bits of selection, but only one line is active at a time. And since we have to source current to this, so we have to source voltage here and then sync it down into the uh, LEDs, which means we need a PNP transistor and Luckily, PMP transistors are activated by basically active low, and then the 3D8 encoder is active low. See that? So only one of them is active at a time. So I'm wondering if what I can do is if I can basically uh, use three of these encoders to make... <laughs> oh wait, no, actually I would only need... Uh... No, I would need three. No, I would need four. Ugh. <laughs> yeah, so I have um, 32 outputs divided by eight, which means four. So I'm gonna need four 3D8 encoders. And then I could wire it up in octal, so I could have three pairs of, I'm sorry, I could have four pairs of three bits. Actually, no, oh man, that's tricky. I think it could work, I just have to figure out the circuit. But what I'm gonna do for starters is wire up a PNP driver for this. So I'm just gonna do, uh, I'll just do two to start out. So this is a PNP transistor. Luckily, I have a whole bucket full, right? And in the case of this one, we'll probably, well, gosh, let's see. Oh, let's see, column one is line 13. Oh, that's so convenient. Uh, let's see, 16, 15, 14, 13, so that's four over from the top. I guess we can make that work. Should pretty much hook this right up to it, although I'm sure I won't be that lucky for the rest of it, as luck would not have it. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna put the, oh wait, shoot, I have to make sure that I have the emitter base collector right, because it's actually the other way around with A, P, and P. Well, anyway, I'm gonna hook, I'll just hook up two P and P, transistors to two columns and then have one bit returning so we can see if the selection works. So let me just double check the uh, pin out of this and I'll be right back. All right, so I got two uh, PNPs here. That and that. I may be starting to already regret my decision. I chose this life. It's for science. A clock is for science. <laughs> I have invented the world's first clock 500 years after everyone else. Suck it, Copernicus. Amazing. Well, if it was an Apple clock, then it would be the clock reinvented. Ugh, oh, yeah. Oh, man, I'm gonna, I don't even know if I can fit all these on here. This is the kind of thing that you should probably, you know, hey, kids, don't do this at home. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I got 13. One is 13, so that's easy. So we're, what's the next one? Okay, 15 is sort of nearby. Well, yeah, look at this is so confusing. So you got column number and then pin number. And of course the pins are on different sides of everything. So it's just a big, how do you do? Look, I just need two to test my theory because I have to see if I can make one active while the other one is inactive. Well, it's not a theory. I mean, I know this works. I'm testing my uh, design idea. There, that's how I'll put it. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this wire up here past that wire. So since they've already both been wired, it's not a big deal. This is kind of like when I was doing that Z80. See, I don't know. Wiring is tedious, but I can do it, you know? So, you know, use the skills you got. Use what the Lord gave ya. Yeah, no. Oh yeah. Okay, so what we're gonna have here is we're gonna have a common positive voltage, which is gonna be here. 
And now I'm probably going to put all of the resistor. Well, will that work? Going into when I need one resistor. Oh, it's kind of a diode. Current can't flow in that direction. Oh, yeah, that's a high voltage. Uh, yes, that that yes. Okay, so one resistor per row should work. So let's do. If I hadn't promised Mother on her deathbed that I wouldn't kill you, I would kill you. Maybe I should just hook up a 3 to 8 encoder. I mean, I don't think I can avoid that fate anyway. Uh, of course, we're going to need some inline resistors. I'm going to use, I think, 1K. That should work. Look, I only have to do this 30 more times. Then I have to wire all the buses together. But that's basically it, sort of. Barely an inconvenience. Okay, so I'm going to attach this 1K resistor to each one of the bases. Cool. Oh, you know what? I might as well just hook up my 3 to 8 encoder. I mean, why... Why spoil the fun? Okay, so I don't need the eight to three, I need the three to eight. Uh, let's see, uh, how does this work? 15 down to seven are the outputs, great. All right, so how do I hook that up over here? Uh, about like this. Oh, and of course they're gonna go backwards the way I want because why wouldn't they? Working three to eight. It's like second shift or third shift or something. Yeah, you know what, I'll just cross the wires. I mean, this is going to be a hellish monstrosity to wire anyway. So all of this is going to do exactly one thing. <laughs> this thing is going to be like huge. It's going to, this is going to be like, yeah, it's going to be like Felix's Bella IO project. He had all of that surplus Radio Shack board and it's probably all gone. Uh, okay, so let's see. So we're going to cut the resistor here. Pow. Now the reason I space this out so much is so I can uh, kind of stagger extra copies of this up here, hopefully. I guess we'll I guess we'll see. Although some of these I might put below it. And then I also have to make an 8-bit uh, return bus on the row and terminate that in resistors and that will go to the EEPROM which may or may not work as well. So you know there's like nine billion things that could go wrong with this. All right well I'm going to hook up these to the 3 to 8 encoder and then we can basically put some inputs on the 3 to 8 encoder and see if it works. So we'll have a choice of you know two pixels we can light up. But that will show us if the idea works and then we can wire up the rest of it, which will take forever. So when I turn it on, the second column should be active. Yep, there it is. All right, so then if I pull a low, it should advance to the first column. Cool. All right, and then uh, basically I have this row tied low, so it'll always be on. But what's going to happen is it'll rapidly change columns and, uh, you know, that will give us our uh, persistence of vision image. Yeah, that's pretty cool. All right, uh, yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook up at least the first digit, but at least I know it works. So what I'll probably do is I'll probably have four of these encoders, and uh, they have uh, chip enable lines on them, or output enable, I should say, uh, which should work out pretty well. So basically I'll have another circuit that basically decides which digit we're on, <laughs> and then which of the eight columns within the digit we're on. That's actually, actually, that's not a, a big deal, because it just means we need a two-bit counter with an eight-bit counter below it for a total of a 10-bit counter. Wow, it's, it's clock time. All right, let's go to 12.59 and see if it rolls over to one o'clock. Yep, we're just gonna sit here. I guess I can throw away some of these wires while I wait. If it rolls over to one o'clock, Ben's clock is finished. Not in a bad way, but like in a good way, because you know, like that means it's done. You ever hear that phenomenon with your eyes? Uh, you can see it with clocks like this. Like if you do this with your head and then turn and quickly look, oh, it changed. Oh, anyway, so here's the thing you can check. Um, so when you move your head quickly, your brain erases all of the uh, frames in between. And you can see evidence of this by looking at a clock that has like blinking lights. So turn away like this, and then look at it, and then the uh, 
the blinking period will appear to be longer because your brain is basically filling in the frames. It's kind of, kind of funky. Yeah, that's why when you do this, when you do this, your brain is like chopping out lots of frames. And then it kind of changes the time base. Try it sometime. Like, yeah, just, you have to get it just right. But like, turn your head and then turn and look at a clock. Like, it just happened just there. So you'll either like looking for the blinky light or like for the minute or the second hand changing and you'll see it. Yeah, all right. So uh, just to go over how this works, we have a master clock driver here, 32768 kilohertz. That's driving a 16-bit timer. The 16-bit timer rolls over once every two seconds, creating my patented long second, which is two seconds. And then I'm counting up 30 of those long seconds in order to increment to minute. So basically, this is the long second timer. This is a timer that counts 30 of those. And then when it's full, it triggers the minutes. When the minutes is full, it triggers the hours. And when the hours is full, it resets itself. So then we have a uh, timer here, which is driving the 32 column display. We've got some glue logic around it. And then we got glue logic down here to do the rollover decoding. Then right here, we have two buffers dead bugged on each other. Basically says, hey, are we either drawing the hours or the minutes? And it's controlled actually by uh, the counter going this way. The 2K EEPROM holds all of the character image data. Up here, um, Basically, it's a lot of uh, PNP transistors which drive the columns to activate them. And then above that, we have three to eight encoders, which basically take the five bit number and figures out which column to draw. Yeah, so it's uh, all TTL logic clock. And it's super cool. And I was originally going to do this with just a seven segment display, but then I'm like, I should just really go for it. Since I had exactly four leftover modules of this size. So yeah. <laughs> but it's all that to make a clock. <laughs> you know, someday all of these silicon chips will fit into a single clock the size of your wrist. Unlike Mr. Heckendorn over there who is going all low level on everything, I'm going to use a microcontroller and the real-time clock that I'm going to use is a pretty fancy one. So it's a real-time, RTC is real-time clock, and it's a DS3231. Now, what's so fancy about it? It's fancy because it has the crystal inside of it. There's also a temperature sensor inside of it, so that if there is any sort of temperature variations, and there is drift in the crystal, um, it will compensate for that. And it's got a lot of other interesting features as well. So it has the internal crystal, uh, temperature compens compensator, it's got seconds, minutes, hours, days, month, year, it uh, communicates with the microcontroller via I squared C. So um, I can access all of the information registers to get all this information if I want. It also, one of the pins works at a GPIO, so it could, if, if, uh, if I wanted to, I could set a timer so that it would reset the microcontroller if I felt like that was something that it needed. Um, it also has a one hertz square wave output. So um, for the microcontroller, I'm thinking maybe I'll use an Atmel ATmega 328P um, now for the display, I am going to want to use a graphic LCD, 128 by 64 character, because I want to display all of this information that is on the real-time clock. And then as far as power, I'm going to connect it to a lithium polymer charger and a lithium polymer battery, and then also I'm going to connect a coin cell to the real-time clock. That covers all the components, now I should go collect them and put them together. Hiya! <laughs> All right, so I finished the clock and here it is. Let's see what it can do. I turned it on and it should turn on. Check that out, it turns on. It's 10, 10, 10. So here's the clock, it has a date, it has the time. We got these buttons so we can do some, we can go through, cycle through these menus here. So uh, there's the alarm options. Hey, clock off, there's a welcome menu. Oh, and I have the, uh, I put a piezo there so we can hear it click. A little bit of feedback when we turn the, uh, the knob there. Here's a diagnostic menu. And then here's where we can adjust the time. So there's one thing, uh, there's, there's something that I did on this board here. I made it so that when I turn it off, 
I can disconnect the battery so that um, it'll reset the clock. And then when it, in the, uh, the settings menu here, um, it'll say, hey, power failure, reset the clock. So let's see what happens when I turn it off and we lose power. So, oh, oh, well, I just lost power, the battery died. Okay, we turn it back on. It's zero, 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 zero. Oh no, 2000 and the time is all off. So we can go to the settings menu. Here we go. Okay, here we go. And look right here, it says RTC power fail. RTC reset to build time. So it resets it to the last um, time that the uh, code was compiled. And uh, what we can do here is, what's today? Is the uh, 7th or 18th or 21st? Okay, let's go to 21st, Monday, uh, 10. Do, 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 do. And I'm going to go back to the clock menu. All right. Anyway, so there's my clock. Pretty cool, huh? That's all we have for today. It was really fun doing this clock building competition. Let us know in the comments below whose clock you think was best. Also let us know if you've ever made a clock from scratch before. Or if you integrated a real-time clock into one of your projects. Let us know in the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash tbhs. You can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. Time to die. Okay, here's my reveal of the clock that I made. We need to use up our parts. How many? All of them. Oh wait, I need two of these. Oh, it hurts my heart just looking at this. Ooh. That is the Vectrix. It is a vector-based video game system from 1982. This is a device that can colorize and 3Dify these images. So there is one spinning disc already installed, but the other spinning disc my friend doesn't have. So he's tasked me with reproducing that disc using 3D printers and lasers. Doesn't help that this glove makes it smell like a dentist's office. Please don't murder me. This thing is so rare, there's only like 500 results on YouTube about it. And that's how I lost my face.